Well, uh, thank you for the thank you for the introduction, Sylvian. And uh, it's an honor to be here. It's actually uh, my first time at La Hague, so uh, very pleased to be here. And thank you all for coming in early. Um, so, like Sylvian said, let me see if I can get my computer to work. One second here, if it wants to go. Yes, here we go. So, brief introduction about myself. My name is Nico, Nico Dakins, uh, which actually means couvertures in, in uh, French. So, I keep myself warm all times. Um, I was trained as an all source analyst, uh, in intelligence analyst at the Dutch government. Uh, spent there almost 25 years doing mostly, let's say, counterterrorism work. Uh, I did a lot of stolen art cases. I investigated criminal cartels, youth gangs, basically, you name it, I've done it. A lot of child abuse in the last parts. And when I closed at the Dutch government, I was at what they call a covert unit doing more clandestine operations, mostly geared toward counterterrorism. At that point, Islamic State was really uh, on the high rise. I also worked with the French a lot uh, during uh, all the horrific things that happened around 2015. So uh, I've met some uh, good friends over here already. Um, of course, I was the co-founder of the Ocean Curious Project. Uh, Ocean Curious Project, for those who do not know, the page is still up, but sadly we had to close that shop uh, basically because the group, the community that, that ran that, that webpage at oceancurio.us got busy lives. We all got different jobs, we got other things to do, which made us decide that we needed to stop that. But maybe it will be revamped in a year from now when things free up. Then when I left the government, um, I started teaching at the SANS Institute. So within SANS, I, teach the, um, I taught the 487 course, which, is, which no longer exists. It has been revamped into the 497 course, which is a practical um, uh, open source intelligence gathering and in, uh, analysis course. And I offered the 5871, which is the advanced open source intelligence uh, and collection course. Um, now, then I moved to Bellingcat for, I spent around a year doing project management. So some of the cases uh, I helped basically set up. Uh, I taught a lot of the Bellingcat co courses. But after a year, I decided to leave and started my own business called Dutch Ocean Guy. I already had that name. Um, and now currently, as from January this year, uh, I have a full-time job at Shadow Dragon, which is a United States company that basically builds tools for open source intelligence that scale. So you don't need to do all that stuff manually anymore. But enough ena about me, let's talk about uh, my talk. So my talk is all about um, the ocean state of mind. Uh, and I've noticed that uh, a lot of the talks that we have here, which are absolutely awesome talks, I visited most of them yesterday, uh, are talking about tools, um, and I love tools, but honestly, for me, tools are not open source intelligence. They are part of open source intelligence. So let me start off with talking about um, one of the concepts that open source intelligence, it's not a tool, it's a process. And open source intelligence is collecti collecting publicly available information from open sources, but it's not only collecting that information, it's processing, exploiting, and analyzing that information in order to report on it, to find answers, so to create actionable intelligence. And this is what my talk will be about. You need to turn all the information that you collect into a product that actually addresses that research question. And that's something that I rarely see people talk about within the open source intelligence community in general. So I think that's, that's highly important. So, just to sum up a little bit more about what I believe that open source intelligence is not, open source intelligence is not a tool. It's not a script, it's not a scraper, it's not an add-on, and it's definitely not an operating system. So Kali Linux is not OSINT. It's just an operating system. Which does not mean, don't get me wrong, we need all these tools to perform open source intelligence, to find the answers. Uh, because if you do not use these tools, you're doing your investigation short, and basically, you will spend way too much time trying to collect and process all that information. Now, almost every day in my daily life, I have someone hitting me up on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, no matter where, asking me, Nico, what's that best tool when it comes to open source intelligence? Tell me what tool it is. And my answer always is, um, there's one tool. That's your brain. Your brain is the best tool to perform open source intelligence. So there is one tool to rule them all, and that's thinking, using your brain to find the answers that you are looking for. Um, so with that, I think critical thinking as a process is really, really important. Why? Uh, we all have bias. We all are 
born somewhere and with that that creates bite the neighborhood that you grew, grew up with uh, the things that your parents taught you all form you and with that you sometimes jump to conclusions just by the way you are just, just that's just human nature and there's nothing you can do about it but you can keep it in mind and you should definitely do that at all times you should always be your own devil's advocate or you can ask someone in your team to be your devil's advocate ask those hard questions hey You've presented me some evidence. You've found some information. But what does it mean? Where did it come from? Are those sources trustworthy or reliable? Um, did you take the right steps to configure your tool? Are you sure that this tool is not communicating with some secret server in a country that could make you and your team highly uncomfortable and basically exposing your interest and in your investigation? I see too many people just blindly downloading and installs scripts from GitHub without doing a proper code assessment. I will tell you, I have found hundreds and hundreds of tools on GitHub that are secretly communicating and sharing all the information that you collect with that tool. And now someone else knows what you are interested in. And if you are in, just like I am in, for example, in the counterterrorism field, I feel highly uncomfortable with sharing my interest with a certain nation state that may now know what I'm interested in. So when it comes to using your mind and critical thinking, it's all about asking the right questions. And with that, you will also learn how to fail fast. And with failing fast, I mean, there's nothing wrong with going out online and searching for information and coming to the conclusion that you cannot find anything. That is also part of critical thinking because that will make you reconsider your steps or maybe reconsider even your standard operating procedures and your methodologies. Uh, also, what I think it's important when it comes to critical thinking, the data that you collect, and especially now in these internet days where the amounts of data are so overwhelming, how can you make sure that the data is correct? If you're going to collect, let's say, a leaked or breached database, how are you sure that no one implemented or implanted pieces of information that are deliberately inaccurate, so that contain disinformation or fake news? It's your task to f at least think about it and make your group and team aware about these fall pits that could basically let your investigation go sideways super fast. Now, when, it, when we talk about critical thinking, I read a lot of reports. So, when someone posts a very interesting paper uh, about open source intelligence online, or someone, again, writes, does a great write-up on the situation in Ukraine, there's a lot of things that I, on average, do not see in these reports. Uh, their initial research question. So what was your goal? What were you trying to find out? Take me by the hand as a reader of your report. I want to know what you did. Um, what sources did you pick? And why did you pick those sources above other sources? Why did you not take certain sources? That's really important to put in your report because you need to be aware, most of the times the people that read our reports have little to no knowledge at all about open source intelligence. So you need to basically explain everything in your report like, you're ex like you are explaining it to a four-year-old kid. You need to make sure that they understand the steps that you took, the resources that you used, to come to a certain finding. Um, so when you pick sources, you should always be able to point out if these tools are reliable. And that comes back again to the comment that I just made. If you're going to use someone else's tool, uh, either a free one or a commercial one, you better make sure that those sources are reliable sources and that they are generating information that you can trust. And if you cannot trust them, let's say 100%, you as an investigator should be able to point out what are those gaps? What are those specific things that um, are not trustworthy within a certain tool or report? Now also what I think is important when we talk about a report, what gaps are left behind? Because I will tell you beforehand, no one in this room will be capable of finding a 100% watertight, waterproof answer. That's just simply how OSINT work. You're never 100% certain because you never know when you turn in your report now what may change if new information comes in a second from now, a week from now, a month from now. That may change your entire outcome. So you should be able to point out what are those blind spots in your report or what could be potential blind spots in the near future if new technologies evolve or new platforms come or go away. 
Um, if you used keywords, so if you used words to search for information, why did you use those words? And why did you use them in that specific language? We are now in France. So always keep in mind, if you're going to use keywords, that you should always flip those words around, maybe in different languages, because not everybody speaks French, but definitely not everybody speaks English as well. You may want to flip that into Chinese or Russian, or I, even you can do lead speak, because the hacker community uses that also a lot. So it's always thinking about what words could potentially help me find that information, and you should use and exhaust those resources as much as possible. So when you look at this, when you look at conducting open source intelligence, you should always point out what parts of your research question could you answer, but more importantly, what could you not answer? So you're trying to find answers. That's what open source intelligence is all about. But we will not always find answers because even though the internet and the open sources that we can leverage contain a lot of information, not always we will find the answers that we are looking for. And if you find a partial answer, but you don't think it's important, still put it in your report because the things that you don't find important may be very important to someone else who reads your report and needs to take your intelligence and make decisions and take new steps. Things that you do not find interesting or important may be very important to someone else. And lastly, but certainly not least, if you do not find an answer, that is still an answer. And I want to see that in your report. Because again, if you uh, stop working at the company that you work at now or stop working at the university that you work at now and someone else needs to take your findings and your report and do it all over again, they need to understand what steps you took or what answers you did not find because maybe they can do it over again to find more information because now the information has been updated on Twitter or on Snapchat or on Instagram or on Telegram. So always describe the things that you did not find because that's still an answer. Particularly when I did counterterrorism, very often I had cases where I needed to investigate, let's say, a terrorist cell. So they gave me information, maybe some email addresses, maybe some phone numbers, and I spent a day, two or three or maybe weeks trying to find the individuals that were part of the group. In the end, my answer was, at this moment in time, I, based upon the information that I got, I cannot find information. But that by itself may be very interesting knowledge because it may also tell a story that this terrorist or this terrorist group took deliberate actions not to be found. So that by itself should be pointed out as a possible scenario or hypothesis within your um, final report. So really important that you describe everything, even the things that you do not or cannot find at this current moment in time. So when you, took, when you look at open source intelligence, I am very structured in everything what I do. And I would highly like to encourage everybody in this room to become as structured as I am. Why? It has been consistently helping me over the past two and a half decades. So I've been practicing open source intelligence for more than 25 years now, and there's no tool that will help me do this. I use my brain to keep track of everything. So every step that I take, I note that down in a document. So literally, if I do a Google search, I note down date and time, what search I did, what IP address I used, what operating system I used, and what results I got back. Then I will describe, hey, I clicked on this link. I will make a copy of that. And then I will describe what I found on that page while clicking on that link that might be of interest. But I also po will point out what information was on that page that is at this current point in time not important to my investigation. But it may again become important once I collect new information. So this is why you want to track everything. I also note down my thought processes. Why? Well, we very often make decisions in our investigations. And I like to uh, visualize my investigation as a highway. So on a highway, you can have exit roads and entry roads. And every now and then, you make a decision to go right or left. So I note them down. Why am I going left at this point in time? Well, based upon the information that I've collected and the seed information I got from my client, I decide to go left, which means that I did not go right. Maybe. I need to take a step back once I went left and I found nothing and then go right. So take note of these because if you do not take note of your thoughts, 
you cannot go back a step in time. And again, it's a very time consuming process, but it will make your investigation so much better and so much more structured. And keep in mind, you should always exhaust your resources. And with exhausting your resources, I mean, do not stick only to the tools that you feel comfortable with. Do not only use one search engine. Because Google, as a search engine, very popular, very good, but it only indexes around 8% of the entire clear web as we know it, which means that you're about to miss 90% of the rest of the internet. And I will tell you cases that I've investigated, well, let's make this a little bit more practical. In 2017, I had a case, I was still at the Dutch government, where a, um, a, a Dutch national a terrorist wanted to go into Syria. He wanted to join the holy fight of the Islamic State. He was caught near the Turkish border. In his backpack, there was a little note that contained two words. And basically, those two words were handed over to me and my team, and they asked us, try to find out what this means in relation to potential terrorism. So I used those two words to find out online what I could learn from that. And I started searching on Google, and I found some information but nothing really interestingly that could help the investigation move forward. So if I would stop there, and if I did not exhaust the resources, I would basically do my investigation short. Luckily, I had a very structured process which m demanded me to also visit Bing, DuckDuckGo, Yandex, Weibo, so all kinds of other search engines that also index the internet. And interestingly, when I started comparing those results, some had overlap with the results I found in Google, but some found information that was not indexed by Google. And this is what I mean with exhausting your research. If I stopped at Googling, I would have not found the answer that I was looking for. Because in the end, I did the same search in DuckDuckGo, the search engine, the privacy-orientated search engine, and I found one page that deliberately talked about those two words, which were basically two places near the Turkish border that particularly European terrorists used to get into Syria. And it actually showed an article of a little van with a Dutch license plate that was in no government database, but it was an actual van being used by terrorists to get into Syria from Europe. So this is, again, a real practical story that you should always exhaust your resources. If I stopped at Google, I would have not found that answer. And with that, we were able to prevent, let's say, a specific route to be used by certain terrorists to get into Syria and join that holy fight. Now, I've been talking about methodology for a couple of minutes now. And um, over the years, I've uh, created a 14-step methodology which I think can be really useful for you all to stick to when it comes to trying to find answers in your open source intelligence investigations. So let's talk a little bit about this 14-step methodology. So the first step in your investigation would be pick that research subject. I think we all know, on Friday, your team leader walks in, panic, um, I want to know everything. That's the question. What is everything? Everything is nothing because if I need to find everything online, it means that I will need to download the entire internet and then you'll have everything. But you still have no context. You will have no answers. So you must do an intake with your client, your team leader, your customer, and define one potentially answerable question. Does not mean that you will find an answer, but you should definitely come up with that one question that you think is a good question. So when you look at the example, a wrong example is, Give me everything about John Doe, because that basically raises more question. What is everything? Who is John Doe? What do you mean with everything? Where should I start? What else do you know about John Doe? But a good question might be, hey, has John Doe been on location X? So has Nico visited Le Hack in Paris? And that could also raise sub-questions. What is Le Hack? Who is Nico? Where in Paris? when exactly, at what moment in time. So you should come up with these questions. And it may seem really dumb that I'm explaining this, but I see too many people, particularly online, reporting on the Ukraine war that are not telling people what questions did they ask themselves? What answers are they trying to find? What steps do you take to get to that answer? So note these down. Now the next step could be is you need to do your homework. So this, at this point in time, my laptop is still closed. 
I will take time to think about what I should do. Um, I should first of all know my client. So I'm now a private consultant. So if I'm, let's say, um, being hired by the French police or the Fr French intelligence services, I should know what they are about. I should know what their interests are. Versus, for example, I recently was hired by Amazon. They have a um, very, let's say, different perspective on their goals. So you should know them, but you should also so know what are the legal implications. Do you have legal backup? Because a private company versus a government means something totally different for your investigations. You will have different limitations or different opportunities. Uh, you should also know your adversary. Who are you going to investigate? Or what are you going to investigate? Because that could pose a risk to you individually, uh, your mission, your computer, your client. So it means something about what you need to consider, your operation security, trying to stay safe as much as possible. So these are things you should take your time to figure out, hey, can I do this on my own? Do I need help? Do I need specialized software, either free or commercial? Do I need training? Do I need skills that I do not know about? These are things that you should never underestimate. I never just, when someone phones me and says, Nika, I want you to find this, I never immediately open up my laptop. I take a lot of time to talk to my client and try to understand what they know. So coming back to that example, can you tell me if Nico visited Le Hack in Paris? I would ask more questions. So what do you know about Nico? Oh, it's Nico Dakins, the guy from the Netherlands. Uh, do you know more? Yes, I've got a phone number. I've got an email address. I know the name of his wife. Those are all things you should ask for because your clients on average do not know what information you need to get your information, to get your information stream started. They do not know what kind of important nuggets you will need to get started. So ask these questions. Even if they seem super straightforward, you should always ask questions. And there are no dumb questions. The dumb questions are not asking those questions at all. Now, once you've given this some thought and you know who your client is, but you also know who your adversary is, for example, if I need to investigate Chinese nation state hackers versus a local cocaine dealer, it means something totally different for my investigation, but also for my personal protection and operation security. So think about these things. Once you've set this up, you want to define your main research question. So that's that one question that I talked about. So when you define your main research question, you will always need to define a set of sub-questions because it will be nearly impossible to find the answers based upon that one research question. You will need sub-questions to help you pivot in different directions on the internet, either on the clear web, the deep web, or the dark web, or even, uh, and that's what people tend to forget, open source intelligence does not limit itself to only the internet. You can go into a library, that's an open source. You can read a newspaper, you can watch a TV show, so those are all open sources. They are freely available for everybody around the world and you can access them. Now, once you come up with that, you can start asking questions based upon W's. So what? What happened? So what happened at La Hack? Could be a question. What happened that Nico went there? Well, in this case, Sylvian was so nice to invite me. That could be an answer. Um, where did it happen? So we need to know exactly where it happened. Why? Now I know where I can potentially geolocate information from by potentially using Snapchat map or doing a Google a geocode search or a Twitter search or an Instagram search. Because if I can find imagery, I can find confirmation of me being at this venue, for example. Um, when did it happen? So time means a lot within open source intelligence because there's so much misinformation but also outdated and inaccurate information. The when question is really important. With what? So what was needed to make this happen? First of all, I needed to travel here. So maybe you can find information on my streams that I told you that I was flying in from New York yesterday. I landed here, so this is why I look a little bit tired. And now then you start asking questions with whom? Who was involved? Am I on my own here? Or am I with colleagues here from SANS, for example? Those are all things that could potentially help you pivot into understanding more about that individual or group or subject matter that you're trying to investigate. Now, also, what was needed to make this happen? Now, first of all, I needed to know people and people needed to know me in order to get me here. 
So that by itself could be part of your report that you could figure out that Sylvian and I have been going back and forth for years online. So we are friends. And that means something to your investigation. It tells you something about my interconnectedness with people. So you can graph that out and say, hey, Sylvian is a connection to Nico. The Sans employees are a connection to Nico. So that tells you something about my network and my people. So, and why? The why question, that's always the most hard to answer question. Why did this happen? And nine out of 10 times, that's an answer that you will not be able to find coming from open sources. Because the why answer will very often only be answered by directly asking or communicating with your target. Why are you planning an attack? Why are you selling cocaine? Why are you illegally transporting children ar across the world for prostitutions? Those questions are first-hand pieces of information that only, in this case, the suspects or the victims may know about. So the why question, very hard to answer. Now, once you know your main research question and then you know your sub-questions, you need to figure out, where do I find this information? Where do I collect this information? Because there's so much information out there. Just for example, the company I work with, Shadow Dragon, we have a collection tool that collects information in over 210 resources, which means that potentially I need to go over 210 resources manually if I don't use that commercial product, which means if I'm going to investigate me, I may need to go to Facebook, to YouTube, to Instagram, to blogs, but do not forget about older places. For example, MySpace, or in the Netherlands, we had Hives, which was equivalent to MySpace and Facebook, because if someone at a certain point in time starts or decides to go dark, they may have a life online before they went criminal or before they b became a hacker or before they started to do sketching stuff. So we still be able to find information. But also, you, this is again coming back to knowing your adversary. For example, in um, the Netherlands, all the people use WhatsApp. I visited um, New York uh, a couple of days ago. No one uses WhatsApp there. So how likely will it be for me to find information about a target on WhatsApp that's coming out of the US? Or if I'm going to investigate someone in China, what kind of applications or what kind of social media platforms are popular in that region? So take time to understand where to potentially find that information, which also means that you now need to understand what these platforms are about. What are the opportunities? But more importantly, what are the risks of these platforms? What could make someone else find out that I'm interested in them? So that's really important. Now, once you've figured out what kind of sources you want to use, you want to gather keywords. And the keywords are, again, based upon those W questions, the what, where, when, with what, whom, what is needed. And interestingly, if you come up with one keyword, so here I search for the word uh, research, you will see that there are so many alternative words that are closely related to research that I could potentially all use and even translate into different languages that could help me get a set of important keywords that will help me point me in the right direction to collect the information from those sources. So I was looking into the situation that is going on now in Paris. The, I'm very sorry for you all that this is happening. Uh, but it's so interesting to see because I'm from the Netherlands. I speak Dutch. I speak English. I speak a petit peu French. And that's about it. Uh, but it means if I need to monitor the situation in France because I already got information that there will be riots in Amsterdam and The Hague probably tonight, as well as in Brussels, as an effect from Paris, it means that I need to understand certain specific French words to help me understand where to look or people that are fueling uh, riots for uh, the Netherlands. So it's really important that you take the time to explore as many keywords as you can. And this is why hashtags are so important. If you find a hashtag, try to figure out what other hashtags are being used by that same community or same group in order to help you pivot in other directions on maybe other platforms. Really important to take your time and explore those opportunities and find as many keywords that might be interesting to find answers to your research question. Now, the next step would be is, okay, basically this means now I'm almost ready to go. So it means that I'm doing my homework. I need to keep my operation security in mind. So do I need to spin up a virtual machine that is containerized, that is locked down? Do I need a VPN connection? 
Do I need a Tor connection? Do I need a uh, device fingerprint obfuscation? So am I going to deny them that they, that they can figure out that I'm using a MacBook? May, I may want to use a user agent to pretend to be something else. I may want to change my language settings. I may want to change my time zone settings on my computer so it matches the region that I'm investigating. So when I was investigating the Islamic State groups, I always made sure that my keyboard, keyboard settings were set to Arabic. I also made sure that my time zone settings were set to that region, and I also made sure that my IP address and my VPN were communicating out of that region. Again, it's all about blending in and not standing out. Um, then the next step is once you know I, I, give, I think operation security is similar to a pilot taking up with a plane. They will never take that plane into the sky without doing a systems check. So they will always check their systems and if they are safe to go, will it not crash? Because that's basically what we are doing. We are flying over the internet and we do not want to crash. We want to make sure that no one knows that we are we and we want to make sure that we can find the information. So the next step would be is that we need tools. So if you're going to use tools, make sure that you know who owns the tool. And you may need to make sure how the tool was built. And you need to make sure that those tools do not eavesdrop on you, that they do not collect information about you, your machine, and your mission. And I will tell you, there are numerous open source intelligence tools out there, free and commercial, that will collect information about you, your machine, and they will send it to, let's say, a country that may make you very uncomfortable. So make sure that you do your homework on these tools. Of course, automate. Um, 10, 15 years ago, most of my investigations I could do manually. Nowadays, with all the platforms that we have, it's nearly impossible to do things manual anymore. You need automation, which also means you may need to understand programming languages. So for example, in my SANS class, I teach people uh, Python in one and a half day, which is impossible. My main goal is that people should be able to read Python code to understand what opportunities there are, there are in that code, but also what risks there are in that code. So make sure that you also understand, not let's say foreign languages, but sometimes you may also want to understand programming languages because the tools that we rely on are basically written in a language, which you can learn how to read. Um, then you may want to visualize data because if I'm collecting information about you, you and you and all your friends and your connections, we need to visualize that and see who is a key player in the network, who's a foot soldier, who's a follower, who's a leader. So you may want to visualize that. You can do that with tools like Multigo. You can do that in Alice Notebook. You can do it in Palantir. But you can also do that in good old Gephi, a free graph analysis tool. There are so many tools out there. Um, but most importantly, do not forget to use your mind. Do not get lazy. Do not solely rely on commercial and third-party tools. But also, when it comes to using your mind, make your investigations a group effort. The things that you think about Someone else may not think about, but they may have thought about something that you did not think about. And it's amazing to see if you work with, let's say, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit old when I walk here in, on this floor, that younger kids come up or younger people come up with an angles because they look at the world from an entirely different perspective. So when I was in the government, I was in a team, for example, where I, had, I was the only guy in the team and the rest were women. And it was so eye-opening to me because they looked at the world in a total different way that I did. And it had something to do that they were women and I were men, and they basically looked at the world differently when it comes to trying to find information, but also trying to analyze information. So make sure that your teams and your background are diverse. So not only men and women, but maybe also people from different cultures. I will tell you, I have numerous cases where we had successes just by having a good, high quality team when it comes to open source intelligence. Now, once you've done this, you've set up your machine, you've gathered the keywords, you know what you're looking for, you know what your research questions are. Um, my suggestion would be to take the next step, step seven, and that's a quick scan. And the quick scan for me is a timer search. I will set an alarm clock and I will take, let's say, 30 minutes to an hour and do, let's say, an initial search. Why? This is, for me, a good case to understand how much information is out there. Because if I find only, let's say, one Facebook page on my, on my target, it means something. If I find 10 pages, 
where he posts every five minutes, it also means something for my next steps. So when I do a timer search, it also gives me the opportunity to go back to my client and say, hey, you want an answer tomorrow, but I did a quick scan. And based upon the amount of information that I'm seeing now, I will tell you beforehand, I need more time. I need more time to find answers to your research question. And if they say, well, I cannot give you more time, then you can tell them, hey, based upon my quick, quick search, I will suggest you that in that case, we will only look here and here, and we will leave these other places behind. We will take note of them because we might want to revisit them later on, but within the given time, I can only do this much, so we need to prioritize where to look, or more importantly, where not to look. So a timer search is really the key to success, especially if you are under time pressure. Now, once you did that, you find information from the timer search, and you basically need to review your quick scan. And this is, if I could turn back time, I've had these moments so many times where I found information, but I basically drowned myself in data. And then I had that moment, if I could turn back time, and maybe I should have gone right instead of going left, because now basically I found so much information that's meaningless, but I still need to do something with that. So when you look at your preliminary findings, you need to understand, am I going in the right directions? Am I finding what I expect to find? Am I finding what I'm hoping to find that addresses those intelligence requirements? And if in that quick scan, I do not find information that I can use to analyze that addresses that intelligence requirement, I may not have set up my research good. I may need to go back to one to step one and five and see if I use the right keywords, if I pick the right sources, if I configured my machine in the right way. I might just have made mistakes. And we're only human. We make mistakes all the time. Now, once that is done and you are confident enough that the timer search uh, gave you enough information to go in the right direction, you can move forward. And this is where you basically start scaling up your collection part. So will you, you will use your research questions to use those keywords and tools to collect as much information as you can, preferably in a short time frame. Because the collection part in open source intelligence is what I like to think is the easy part. Collecting data is easy. Making sense of the data to answer questions that's the hard part. And that's the often overlooked part within open source intelligence. So OS inf Open source information is not OSINF, open source intelligence. OSINF, OSINF is something that I see very often happen on people that are, let's say, on Twitter exposing what they found. Finding something always lacks context. Open source intelligence is a rigid process and methodology that addresses that intelligence requirement. Now, once you've done that, you basically end up with your huge haystack of information. And within that haystack, you're trying to find that needle, that needle that answers your uh, intelligence question, that answers your intelligence requirement. So once you do that, you need to start going through that data and you need to uh, clean the data because very often we collect data in suboptimal formats. We may collect Excel spreadsheets. We may collect CSV data. We may collect pictures and videos that we need to sort and refine into a normalized standard, for example, to import that into a graph analysis tool or a video analysis tool. Or we need to extract the uh, audio from a video and then let that transcribe into text. These are all next steps that we need to take on the collected data. We need to cut out noise. So we need to cut out the information that's absolutely irrelevant for our investigation. We need to order, we need to tag, we need to label our information. So we need to label everything that ties back to your suspect or subject. We need to order it in maybe in alphabetical order or in a timeline. Those are all steps that you need to take to tell the story in the end in your report. Um, so it's all about connecting the dots, but it's also to point out the unknowns, to point out the gaps in your, in, in your investigation. What are the blind spots and what can I now potentially do to find or find new pivot points that will basically close these gaps. So they will basically go over your uh, findings one more time. So this is your first analysis, your first big analysis, where you go back, what are my primary findings? Am I still going in the right direction? And if not, 
I may want to take a step back again and make sure that I go over my research questions and see if I'm still using the right sources, if I'm still going in the right direction, is my machine still set up? So it may be an opportunity based upon my first analysis, since I now know where the unknowns are, where the gaps are, that I now know, oh, I forgot to look on a dark web forum. Or maybe now I need to look at that specific social media platform, but with different keywords in order to find the missing pieces of information. Now, once that is done, you're basically ready to report. And this is where I would like to encourage you to take time because this is your final product. This is something that you should be proud to present to your client, to your team lead and boss, and you should include everything. So also the things that you did not find, also the dead ends that you, that you ended up with. So, and you should test your findings or stress test your final conclusions with, for example, ACH, the analysis of competing hypothesis. So make sure that you be your own devil's advocate. Make sure that you stress test your outcomes for reliability, consistency, trustworthiness. Those are things that you should do. And then you start writing your report. And I will tell you, if I spend two or three weeks investigating, I may also spend two or three weeks writing a report, which is hard because most of us are under time pressure. And our leaders will definitely not always give us the time to write that report. But you should demand that time because that's the product where they will make decisions upon. So they better make sure that you did your job well. And to do your job well, you need time to write that report, but also to um, basically do some checks. So once you've written your report, my advice would be, would be do not immediately send in your report. Let it rest for a day, maybe two days. You would be amazed the amount of times when you just are ready to head to bed. I always have these moments. As soon as my head uh, reaches the pillow of my bed, I'm like, ooh, I've got this marvelous idea. I know that I now also need to look here. Or, oh, I wrote this in my report, but it doesn't really make sense. Let me rephrase that part of my report. Uh, be your own devil's advocate. Keep your biases in mind. So avoid those assumptions. Just thinking like um, all people from the Netherlands ride bikes or all people from the Netherlands wear wooden shoes or eat, che or eat cheese. That, those are biases. We should make sure that we keep them out of our reports. Now. These last two bullet points are probably the most important part of my final step in my report. I will always lead someone, let someone else who is in, let's say, the open source intelligence field prove read my report. They will point out gaps. They will point out stuff that does not make sense in your report. But more importantly, I will definitely let someone outside of the OSINT expertise read my report. For example, when I let my report, uh, when sometimes when I um, um, hand over my report, well, for example, to my mother, she has no knowledge about, about cyber rosint, but she can read and she can understand things. And she will point out things in my report like, hey, Nico, you wrote this and you wrote that Johnny knows Peter, but where's the evidence? It's not in your report. It doesn't make sense. Can you tell me more? So it's so important that you let other people read your work before you send it in. You would be amazed about how much information you will get back as feedback that will make your report even better or will make you want to reconsider your investigation and maybe stop your report for a moment and collect some more data and analyze that data and then embed that new information and report based upon that feedback. Definitely do that. So we are at step 13, and it's a 14-step methodology. But I want to take a quick sidestep here. And the sidestep is um, I'm a great advocate for the reset methodology. So it stands for re routine, emotion, severe, and explore and think. And I will walk you through all of these steps. So this is something, um, again, that's part of that open source and methodology that you need in your investigations to become an advanced, really thorough open source intelligence analyst. So routine stands for having that structured methodology, having your playbooks, having your standard operating procedure, write those new ideas down, talk to people, 
collect those new resources and embed those new possibilities in your standard operating procedures because you will all have these cases that you will run into every two weeks. We always need to find someone or we always need to find something. So you will have these standard operating procedures. Now, when we talk about the E within reset, that's emotions. And this is really important. Um, do not hide emotions. Make sure that if you are working on, let's say, I worked a lot in trying to investigate child pornography groups. That's horrific stuff. There is stuff in there that you will never unsee. As well as in my time when I was investigating the Islamic State, I was eating my lunch while people were being decapitated. And people walked by my office like, Nico is kind of crazy. He's eating lunch while people are being murdered. And that also made me aware that my brain was starting to get a little bit, let's say, effed up. Pardon my French. Uh, so it prevents you from getting vicarious trauma. Vicarious trauma means secondhand trauma. By watching horrific events, you can get traumatized and you can get PTSD. So make sure that you do not hide your emotions, but also take time to step away, write down those emotions. But sometimes you can also consider if you need to watch horrific content to maybe turn off the audio so you will not be exposed to the sounds or maybe change the colors from colors to black and white because if you need to watch really bloody things in black and white the impact on your brain will be less so i've written a blog on vicarious trauma on oceancurio.us if you're interested you can take a look there but do never underestimate how traumatized you can get from let's say investigating all kinds of horrific things Look at what we have going on in Ukraine. There is so many horrific things going on. But also here in Paris this week, there are so many things that could potentially traumatize you just by watching that footage. So keep that in mind during your investigations. Now, Sever, so really important to me, disconnect, take some time away from your computer. On average, I work 80 to 90 hours a week. So I need to unwind. I need to spend time offline. I need to give my mind some rest because it will also help me find and refine focus on my investigations. So you need to spend time offline. You need to open your mind by new ideas. And the only way to do that is sometimes to take a step back and maybe sport or work out or practice art or whatever. So my side hobby is collecting sneakers. I'm a sneakerhead. That's what I like to do in my free time. Just not spending time looking at, let's say, all the horrific things in the world. Now, the next step could be explore. And explore means when I have re a free time, I like to spend as much time as I can to understand how platforms work. So what are the opportunities and what are the risks of these new platforms? So last year, all of a sudden, an app called Be Real popped up, really popular in Europe. I need to understand what it means to me, my investigations, what new opportunities do I have, but also what new risks are involved by trying to explore that platform. So looking for new things and do not be scared to fail. It's okay to fail. I do trial and error all the time. This is why I reserve what I call nerd time. Nerd stands for never ending research and development. So every Friday, I like to take at least half a day, if possible within my busy agenda, to explore new things, explore new forums, new platforms that I never visited, to understand what it could potentially mean for future investigations. And that's something that also, if there's any leadership in the room, give your employees time to learn, give your employees time to explore new things, because this world is moving so fast that you will need to have that time. You will need that. Apple is rolling out new glasses. What does it mean for open source intelligence? Can I collect information from there? What does it mean for my operation security? How can I understand what I need to be prepared for when it comes to the future of open source intelligence? So revisit the known things, look for change. Look if something changed. I, did it, I do this all the time because things change all the time. So last night, Twitter or Elon Musk, he made it impossible to search Twitter without being authenticated as a user which means something to me in my investigations. I will tell you now, don't, don't tell Elon this. If you change your user agent to a Google bot or a WhatsApp user agent, you can still search Twitter without being authenticated. But again, that's just telling you really practical that you will need time to explore these new opportunities. And sometimes you will need to do that very fast. 
especially if you rely on certain platforms for your information streams. But also you need to understand what are these operational security risks. So that's really important. Now, this last step, think. And again, it may be a little bit disappointing for you that I did not share all kinds of tools. There's no need for me to do that. There's so many good talks here that talk about tools. I really, really wanted to talk about the mind state. Open source intelligence is not a tool. It's all about thinking and using your brain. And you will need tools and techniques to get the information. But the most important part is using your brain. So take your time to deep think about the things that you need to investigate. Formulate hypotheses and scenarios and come up with the most absurd scenarios, scenarios as you can. You would be amazed that sometimes the most impossible scenario might be the one that gives you the answers that you're looking for. And that all comes down to asking the right questions again. And thinking takes time. So you need to claim that time with your team leads, with your employers, with your companies, because you need that time. And everybody wants an answer yesterday. So when you look at this quote, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I will spend 55 minutes thinking about that problem. And that's what I do. I think a lot. So if you don't spend time thinking on what are the opportunities, what are the downsides and the upsides in investigations, you are always doing your investigation short at all times. Now, with all these tips in mind, we are now ready to send in our report, which means we turn over that big pile of paper that shows all the evidence that answers those intelligence requirements. And very often, your client will come back and say, hey, thank you for the report, but now we have follow-up questions. And then all you need to do is stick to the 14-step methodology and basically update your report. And with that, you will also be able to show someone else what steps you took. And this is why it's so important, because if I get sick or on a holiday and my colleague needs to continue my work, they can basically go over all the steps that I took and they can see in great detail what I did do, but more importantly, what I did not do, because that will help them understand what steps they can now take to find new answers. And with that, I would like to thank you all. Um, if you want to know a little bit more, I've written a blog a couple of years ago that basically goes over this talk. You can visit it there. And if you want to know uh, a little bit more about me, you can um, always look me up. Just look for Dutch Ocean Guy. I'm online everywhere. Uh, and if you have questions, always feel free to send me an email or contact me somewhere online. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nico. It's a pleasure. Um, OK, do we have some questions? We have time for some questions. Yep. Nico, thanks for your presentation. I want to ask you, in your job, you maybe needed to think outside the box to get the job done. And I want to ask you, how do you do how you think outside the box to get yes. the job done? Good question. So uh, what I like to use is I like to use students. <laughs> no, honestly, um, I'm getting old, uh, which means that there are new platforms online that make no sense to me at all. I have a hard time understanding them. Uh, so I talk to young people. I, I have two young kids. I talk to them all the time, trying to understand how they look at the world from the, an open source intelligence perspective. So I talk to them and say, hey, what are new platforms that you are interested in? Where are your friends communicating? Um, also, when it comes to thinking outside the box, um, I, the reset steps that I talked about, just taking your time, grabbing yourself a cup of coffee or a good wine here in France, and just sit and think about your problem, preferably with a group, and do some deep thinking, get a big piece of white paper and say, hey, this is our problem. These are the things that I thought of. Now you all help me out. And you would be amazed how many good new things you will get out of by doing this in a collective. So I hope that answers your question. Other questions? Yep. Hi, Nico. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, because I think it's also a very important point to em emphasize uh, about the resources you may have for your mental health when researching this, for 
you know, all the ISIS and, and other stuff, if you have some recommendations about this. Yeah, so um, Bellingcat wrote a good blog also about uh, vicarious trauma. Um, of course, the ones that I wrote, uh, but also there are some, on average, I would suggest that you simply, s we're all ocean people here, right? We can know how to find stuff. So look for the words vicarious trauma. There's a lot of good, good research that will give you tips on how to prevent on getting traumatized. But I think uh, the Bellingcat blog is a really good one when it comes to understanding on how to prevent on getting traumatized. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your um, talk, which was very interesting. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna talk about tool and while well, you spoke about methodology, but uh, for instance, when you're doing an investigation and you said that if you're sick, someone has to take it over, uh, how do you keep track uh, with with which tool, uh, which tool do you use to keep track of the investigation? Like, is it a mind map or a checklist or all this kind of thing? That's a, that's a good uh, good question. So, what do I use to keep track of my investigation? Um, there's no one tool that will do that. So, for me, it's always a combination between uh, a good old notepad, so just a pen and paper, uh, in combination with uh, I do a lot of spreadsheeting in. Excel or whatever you want to do, and I like to mind map because I'm a visual thinker, and that that particularly works for my brain, but that will definitely not work for everybody. So it's always a combination between mind mapping, spreadsheeting, um, and project management tools. I like to use project management tools every now and then. Hey, Nico. Uh, thank you for your presentation. A lot of the tips that you had kind of somehow need you to take extra time or more time. And I was just wondering how you explain this to your bosses, to your client, to your hierarchy, because uh, I th from my own experience, I'm, I'm gonna be talking after you now about uh, the journalistic approach to some of these things. Uh, and we have a lot of time pressure and I also have a lot of people to deal with that don't really understand that you need to take a step back and it's kind of hard to understand, uh, to explain, right? Do you have a tactic or like a neat little trick to make them understand that things take longer than they think? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I always tell them, hey, if you're going to go on a holiday, what do you do? You plan. Planning takes time. But the trip to get to your holiday as destination always also takes time. That's basically the equivalent to an investigation. You need to plan your investigation. And the route to get the answers is the trip to your holiday destination. And if I explain it to leadership like that, now all of a sudden they somewhat better understand, but to be dead honest, most leadership doesn't care about us. They want an answer yesterday. Um, I think it's still always your task to tell them, hey, okay, I looked at your target. I looked at that Facebook profile. This guy posts 15 posts per hour. No one in their right mind can go over their, their timeline with let's say 10,000 posts in the last five years in an hour. That's impossible. So then I will tell leadership, now you decide, what do you want me to do? Spend one hour or do you want me to spend a week to give you a good answer? And I will let them decide because they will get a half-baked answer if I only get an hour. Thank you very much, Nico. It was a pleasure welcoming you in Paris for the hack and I hope you will come uh, the next years. Oh, most definitely. Thank you very much, okay. Nico. Thank you.